What's up? You got your boy Direct, aka Native Shades, reminding you to like and subscribe. Cause today we're gonna be talking about Boom Bap. What had happened was So the year is 1979. I said a hip hop. Hippie to the hippie, the hip, the hip hop. You don't stop and rock it to the bang, bang, boogie. Take up, jumps the boogie to the rhythm, to the boogie, the beat. <laughs> that's, that's what you remember, right? That's what you know. <laughs> Might have gotten it wrong, but you know. <laughs> but the year was 1979. We was about to enter the crazy 80s. But before that, a rap group called Sugar Hill Gang Hit the top 40 with this hit single, Rapper's Delight. And like that, the music that the kids were rocking at the parks late at night was now in full effect. Man, you had great groups like the Furious Five, the Treacherous Three, Run DMC. <laughs> you had dope crews back then. Hip hop was everything to the streets at this time. You had great producers like Larry Smith, who produced Sucker MCs for Run DMC. He produced Rockbox for Run DMC. He produced Five Minutes of Funk for Houdini. You know that song? He produced that. In that song, the rapper in his verse actually tells you how much time is left in the song. That's crazy. <laughs> Larry Smith was an exceptional producer. He used gear like the Emu emulator, the first version, the Emulator 1, which was Emu's first polyphonic synthesizer keyboard that allowed you to sample a sound and spread it out on the keyboard and play it as musical notes. He was using equipment like Roger Lynn's Lindrum, one of the illest drum machines at the time that made realistic drum sounds. He even used the $30,000 legendary Fairlight synthesizer. Let me tell you something. Larry Smith was producing a lot of Run DMCs and Houdini songs over, overseas in Europe. You know, the States didn't even have SSL boards back then. You know what I'm saying? Most of the acts didn't have that. So he had to go overseas to Europe and France and everything like that to use the SSL boards. That's how come those Houdini tracks, they sound so clean. <laughs> so we fast forward to the mid 80s. Things are getting a little bit more ruggeder. MCs are no longer wearing Godfather hats and black leather jackets or dressed up in silk shirts. <laughs> now they're wearing Kangos and Puma hats. They're starting to rock a lot of jewelry. There's a lot of bling bling coming into the scene. And a producer known as Marley Moore out of Queensbridge stumbled into sampling, as he says. He was just playing around with a James Brown record. He sampled a portion of it. And when he hit the key, it played a drum kick. And he said, hold up, wait a minute. So then he sampled a snare. And he hit that key and it played the snare. <laughs> he looked around, he was the only one in the studio, but he said out loud to himself, do you know what this means? He said, I could take any sound I want to and replay it back as a note in my music. This, this is revolutionary. This was like Benjamin Franklin stumbling upon electricity. The game has now officially changed. They were like, how come his songs sound like that? They used to say Russell Simmons used to organize meetings and just storm around the room, screaming at the producer saying, how come you can't make hits like Marley Marr? And with this technology of sampling drum sounds and everything, you kind of started to hear the music change. Like when you listen to songs like Slick Rick and Dougie Fresh, The Show, or LL Cool J, I can't live without my radio. <laughs> the drums were basically just simple drums from a drum machine. Like you can literally hear it as like a hit from a Lindrum or something like that. But things started to change in the realm of hip hop. It started to change faster than brand name clothing. And I'm telling you, in the mid 80s to early 90s, 
brand name clothing was the inch? <laughs> you had to have on Guess, Polo, Call Kanai, Cross Color, Tommy Hilfiger, Damage. <laughs> you had to have all the flyest brand names on. If not, you was deemed as whack. <laughs> I'm serious. You could be a new kid in the class and you could really be considered a nerd. You know what I'm saying? You can go into the classroom, sit down, and the kids look at you like you're some kind of cornball, throwing crunched up papers at your head and throwing airplanes at you and stuff like that. But let you take off your jacket and you have on a polo shirt and guest jeans? Immediately, your ranking went up to the number two popular kid in the classroom. <laughs> People was wearing so many brands in the late 80s, early 90s. It, it, it was like you were a NASCAR driver. You know, when you pull up to the, to the cockpit and stuff and they're like, hey, hey, Greg, yeah, you're doing great, man. You're doing awesome. And you're about to drive off and they're like, wait, wait, wait. We just got three new brands. It's Kellogg's, Fruit of Balloon, and Viagra. Stick them on your jacket and wear them proud, Greg. Go, go, go. But not only was the clothes changing, so was hip hop. Around the late 80s, 87, 88, 89, the texture of the music started a shift. You started hearing tracks like the symphony with Big Daddy Kane, Master Ace, Craig G and Cool G rap just going in on like the first official posse track. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Where a whole bunch of dudes is just rhyming on the same track, trying to outshine each other low key. <laughs> you started hearing the drum sounds kind of change. All of a sudden, they started to get a little bit more grimier. And now you fast forward to the 90s, 1990, 91, 92, and the drum sounds really started changing. You started to hear tracks like Nas, It Ain't Hard To Tell. You started to hear tracks like Down With The Kings with Run DMC and Pete Rock and CL Smooth. And, and even tracks like Chief Rocker by Lords Of The Underground. Boom shakalaka, yo, here comes the Chief Rocker, the Lord Chief Rocker, number one Chief Rocker. <laughs> that joint ringed crazy in the streets, just to let you know. Every car that was driving by was bumping Chief Rocker. <laughs> and there was other music. There were, there were hundreds of songs at that time that you could hear the difference in the programming of the music. And that, ladies and gentlemen, was when Boom Bap was born. Now, what particularly made Boom Bap? Like, what is it that makes Boom Bap? What was it that was special about this kind of music? Well, first of all, I'm not even sure if it was really the music or the instruments, the beats that brought in the boom bap kind of sound. I really think it was the artists. It was the rappers of the time. The rappers changed. You know, it was no longer Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince telling you parents just don't understand or Kid and Play yelling, hola, hola, hey. Rolling, rolling, roll, we're Kid and Play now. Rolling, rolling, roll, we're Kid and Play now. <laughs> it was no longer that kind of rapper where everyone's just having a good time at the cookout. No, no, the rapper changed. Now when you had a record label meeting with a rapper, you would see four guys in the meeting room and they're like, Okay, um, who are you guys? What's your name? Our name is Thug. They're like, oh, okay, so what do you guys stand for? We said our name is Thug. T is for terrible, U is for ugly, H is for hell, and G is for jail. Cause a thug can't spell. <laughs> These were how the rappers were coming in the meetings. <laughs> All of a sudden, you started getting grimier artists. You had the notorious B.I.G., who might have came in on a rapper tip, but turned into Frank White. You had guys like Nas telling the grimiest street stories. You know what I'm saying? Putting it all together in poetry. You had hardcore crews like Onyx telling you literally to throw your guns in the air and buck buck like you just don't care. <laughs> 
like seriously and at the shows people were throwing guns in the air <laughs> and they were buck bucking like they did not care <laughs> but the music changed because the artists changed the artists got more grittier and grimier and they demanded the grittiest hardcore grimiest beats to tell their stories and the producers at the forefront of this new way of making their sound was guys like Pete Rock and DJ Premier, Q-Tip, Large Professor, and a slew of other producers, Easy Moby, Trackmasters, 45 King, RZA, Prince Paul, DJ Muggs, Havoc. The list goes on and on and on and on and on. These dudes were making the most rugged tracks now. Now, as far as the workflows that they were using to formulate this special potion known as Boom Bap, what they were doing was, you know, you might have a kick and a snare on your beat, you know what I'm saying? Even a hi-hat. So your beat might be going like Boom Bap, Boom Bap, Boom. And you might have the hi-hat running. And it's all good, right? Yeah. These guys started stacking the kicks meaning putting other kicks on top of the kick they already had you know what i'm saying so you might have your james brown kick but now you take another kick from another record and put that on top of the james brown kick and a kick from this rock record and put that on top of that kick you know what i'm saying and all of a sudden now your sound was fat you had a fat just crunchy kind of kick <laughs> you know what i'm saying and they was doing the same thing with the snares they was layering snares and with the addition of the legendary hardware pieces that they were using like the mpc 60 and the s950 the emu sp 1200 the insonic asr 10 all these legendary pieces of gear had certain attributes about them that actually lend to creating the boom bat sound. Like the MPC-60, the SP-1200, they kinda already had artifacts in the unit that could make your sound a lot more crunchy. And some equipment like the MPC enabled you to add swing, which now instead of your track going boom bat, boom bat, it would go boom boom bat, boom boom bat, boom boom bat boom ba bat <laughs> you know those little ghost notes in the in the middle to kind of add that groove yeah bro the mpcs was coming in with that groove and with this producers even started to sample differently like before they would just kind of take a loop or make a sort of collage in their music like if you go back and listen to eric b and rakim paid in full the way they sampled was more like a collage of sounds, almost like a painting. But now, over this boom bat, producers was now chopping up the samples like Ginsu. <laughs> they were now flipping tracks like acrobats, man, for real. Instead of the normal human nature Michael Jackson track, where it's... Da -da -da -da. No, Large Pro had that joint going... Da -da -da -da. <laughs> he flipped and bounced that joint magnificently but once again with everything time started to change and all of a sudden new producers started stepping into the scene guys like timbaland who was flipping his beats making it sound more like techno or guys like chad and pharrell the neptunes that sounded like they were pulling instruments and sounds from out of space. You had Dr. Dre evolving the G-Funk sound with Scott Storch and even dudes like Manny Fresh adding a little Southern bounce. The music started changing again, but the one type of sound that came up from down under <laughs> and kind of just sneaked attacked the whole rap industry was, yes, ladies and gentlemen, you guessed it, trap music. You had hi-hat rolls, thunderous 808s, all kind of keyboard sounds and melodies. The boom bap producers were in a frenzy. They was like, hey man, this ain't how we make music. This ain't true school. What is this? All of a sudden, Southern rappers came up to the forefront, grabbed the microphone and said they got something to say. 
The boom bap sound had no other choice but to fall back. Trust me, they were fighting. They were fighting hard. <laughs> I was in the fight. Like, no, down with trap, down with trap. But after a while, it took over and there was no more fight. You just had to let them take their place as the new hip hop sound. Now, as time went on, things started to change again. Trap was now over 10 years old. <laughs> and through its journey, other types of music made their way in like drill music and what some folks call lo-fi, you know? Now Trap was kind of like the older brother in the house. <laughs> but all in all, Boom Bap never really left. They always had their core fans that just loved hearing the music. Even though for a while it was pinned as old school, they were cats that just still appreciated Boom Bap. They made Boom Bap beats, they listened to the legendary 90s music from the boom bap era. And some of the trap guys even started seeking out boom bap producers to add a different flavor to their sound. So the boom bap 90s style of hip hop will always have its place in music. And a big shout out to Aristica Michael or Aristica Mikel, <laughs> who recommended I do this video. Dope suggestion. So yeah, that's Boom Bap. What had happened was... So this is your boy, Direct, AKA Native Shades, reminding you to go down low in the description and get that income production video. You ever wondered how to make a couple extra bucks with music production? You know, you listen to some of these cats and they say, hey, just put your beat online. And when you put it online, what happens? nothing happens they say hey give it out for free and when you give it out for free what happens somebody just got your beat for free <laughs> you know what i'm saying and you're asking yourself what kind of magic wizardry must i know to make a sale well i'm gonna show you that magic wizardry in this video so this is your boy direct aka native shades reminding you to like and subscribe and I'm signing off.